morning. Everybody ready? Everybody ready for God's word? Amen. Amen. We're going to be in Acts 25 today. I'll be reading verses 1 to 12, and Brother Ricky will be reading to the end of the chapter. Acts 25, starting in verse 1. Festus, then having arrived in the province three days later, went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priest and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul that he might have him brought to Jerusalem at the same time setting an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in a custody at Caesarea and that he himself was about to leave shortly. Therefore, he said, let the influential men among you go there with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. After he had spent not more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea, and on the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. After Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. While Paul was said in his own defense, I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem, stand trial before me on these charges? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, who I ought to be tried. I have do not done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die, but if none of these things are true to which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus had conferred with the council. He answered, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. Now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. While they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a man who was left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them, that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accuser face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held in the custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. Let's bow together for prayer. We thank you, Father, for the hope that we 
sung about this morning, we heard about from Debbie and was read about in this passage that even when we're standing trial, even when we're going through particular financial or physical trials, emotional difficulties, whatever it may be, you are there for us. It's, it's by no accident, even as Martha said, that David chose these particular songs. And it's by no accident that we've been spending this past year in the book of Acts, which deals a lot with the trials, the troubles, and the tribulations of Paul. It seems like as Paul's difficulties increased, so did ours as a church, so did ours as a nation, so did ours as a world. And so all of this is so appropriate that you time things absolutely, exquisitely, perfectly because you want everything that we see to be applicable to our personal lives. And that's my prayer today, that everyone who is here today, who's taken the time to come to honor you and worship you, will walk out with some nugget of truth, some, some section of gold that can change their lives forever. Speak to all of our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dr. Kenneth Gangle writes, I will never forget an interview I had many years ago with the dean of education at a major state university. I was considering a doctoral study there, and we got into a discussion about my position at a Christian college. Lifting his head, staring at a blank spot on the wall in front of his desk, the dean mused, I used to go to church, so I inquired further about his experience with Christianity. And here's what he said. I remember one thing about church people. They fight. <laughs> and without further word on the subject, he looked back down at his papers. Sometimes that's the way the unsaved see the saints. Folks who just love to fight, creating frictions and factions within the congregation. Religious people who revel in creating rifts. And every church I've pastored, including this one, on many occasions, we've had to deal with troublemakers. It seems like when everything is going smooth, there are some people who say to themselves, I don't like this. I want to rile people up. I want to aggravate people. I want to see how many people I can get to quit the church. And I see this over and over and over again. Because he's right. Church people like to fight. Religious people like to fight. That's how the new governor of Judea, Portius Festus, viewed these vicious Hebrews who were out for Paul's hide in Acts 25. The last verse of the last chapter of last week reveals that Festus has replaced the old guy. And who was that? Felix the cat. You remember him. Now, Felix foolishly left Paul stuck in prison for two years. Now the new kid in the block, Festus, has to figure out how do I handle this religious hot potato? And there was no one hotter in the first century than the Apostle Paul. Paul has no official charges leveled against him, but his countrymen constantly want to kill him. If Festus releases Paul, the Jews would cause trouble. That's not a good picture for a brand new governor. If he held Paul behind bars, then Festus will have to speak to a higher authority as to why he detained a Roman citizen without definitive charges. So he feels stuck in the middle of a religious war between the Jews and another Jew of Tarsus called Paul. Now we know that Paul did not want to be in a battle with the Hebrew people. He loved them. The problem is he preached a radical and revolutionary message. You've seen this if you witness the people in the world. I've heard this in prayer just recently on Facebook. Guys get up in civic centers or, or before, before Congress and they bring in every religion and every person and as long as you coexist and as long as you get together and include every single religious name, we like you. You're a good guy. You're a good girl. We'll give you a kiss on the cheek. 
Because all roads lead to heaven, right? Like all shipping routes lead to Hawaii. Try that out. There's one route to Hawaii, and there's one route to heaven. And when you begin to tell people the truth of the one route, they get angry. And these Hebrews hated Paul because he preached one way, the way of Christ, through crucifixion and resurrection. They want to do him in. And so that puts Paul in a lot of pressure. He finds himself either stuck in the big house or bounced back and forth like a badminton shuttlecock between the religious and Roman rulers of his day. So he continues to endure tough times, wondering how in the world is God going to get me out of this, just like Debbie has been wondering. And then she begins to see slowly God steps in and performs the miracle. Now, is that where you're at today? Are you in a place of wondering? You feel lost in a labyrinth of lousy experiences, and it doesn't make any sense to you. You look at other people that you know who are stuck in sin, who are making bad choices, and they're suffering, and you're thinking, yeah, that guy deserves it. She should go through it. Get him, Lord. But you go, I'm doing everything right. I'm coming to church. I'm reading the Bible. I'm giving financially. I'm loving Christ. I'm being obedient. Why are things going wrong for me? Life looks confused and conflicted. Can't shake this physical ailment. I can't deal with this, this relative who just drives me crazy. There's nothing redemptive in this relationship. I don't know how to handle this frustration that never lets me go. And you're wondering, like Paul's wondering, Will God ever get me out of this? And the answer is yes. You ask when. The answer is in the title of your message today. It may take time. It may take time. It'll take years for Paul to achieve the goal that God gave him in Acts 23, 11. Take courage, for you will be my witness in Rome. That's wonderful, Lord, but when? Maybe that's what you're wondering. When's God going to get me through this maze? When will my dreams materialize? Child of God, don't give up hope. As I shared last week with the, or last Saturday night with the congregation, if God's put a dream or a passion or a design or an objective in your heart and you do everything you can to achieve it and it's not happening yet, God will make it happen. If it doesn't happen here, I'm convinced it will happen in heaven. This is just the starting point of your existence. We think life is all that it is. That's why the world and so many in the church are terrified today of COVID. Because they think, what if I get COVID? You get COVID. What if I die? You die. Big deal. Thank you. Do you know how stupid it is to be foolish of death or to be frightened by death? There is nothing more foolish on all the planet. Now, if you don't know the Lord, you need to be scared to death of death. I agree with you. You should be frightened of COVID. But as a Christian, you can laugh at that stuff. You can laugh at a heart attack or cancer or brain aneurysm or anything. I'll tell you why. Because the instant you take your last breath on earth, the transition is seamless to heaven. Jesus said the angels pick you up and you blink your eyes and you're there. And within less than two seconds, you forget all the troubles and all the trials. And then everything you've ever dreamed about begins to come past. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> Sounds great. So no need to live in fear of anyone or anything. God will get you through. Don't give up hope. You hang in there. God will graciously guide you through the most perplexing times. Now, we're going to see that as we start with our text today. That's point one. The priests pursue their charges. You say, that sounds just like last week. I know it's so similar. We have the same problems, but we have a different location and a different leader dealing with it at this point. Verse one. 
Festus then, having arrived at the province, three days later went up to Jerusalem before Caesarea. Now, you remember Felix of last week was a slave. And so he, he operates like a slave. And sometimes you could see by the way a person governs what their background has been. If a person has been chafing all their life to be a leader, and all of a sudden you give them a position of leadership, look out. They're going to terrorize you. Right? They're the worst people in the world. I've seen that in churches. We've seen that in politics. You see that in, in every area of life. Festus doesn't have the slave mentality. He came of Roman nobility. He was a good leader, according to historians. The problem is he only lived for two years, and then he died. But he wasn't a procrastinator like Felix the cat. You saw right there in the verse I read for you that within three days, he makes a decision to try to deal with this issue with Paul. He's going to go to Jerusalem to hear the accusations the Hebrews have against him, verses 2 to 3. And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought their charges against Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul that he might have him brought to Jerusalem. But at the same time, they're setting an ambush to kill Paul along the way. Now, some of you might remember a film that was popular a few years ago. The film was entitled Kill Bill. <laughs> Kill Bill, part one and two. God's film is entitled Kill Paul. Kill Paul, part one. Turn back to chapter 23 and verse 14. 23, 14. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we've, say with me, killed Paul. That's kill Paul part one. Chapter, 20, chapter 25, now in verse 3, at the same time, saying an ambush to kill him along the way. They tried the same nefarious trick two years ago. They're going to try it again. God will ambush their ambush. Their plan will not succeed. But what I want you to see for a personal aspect today is that it's been two years and their bitterness has not abated because time does not heal resentment. Say that with me. Time does not heal resentment. Feelings that are buried are always buried alive. They're not like water-soluble vitamins you just go through your system. They live. And so if someone hurts you, someone breaks your heart, and you don't deal with the anger, you don't feel the pain and the fury and reach the place of forgiveness in your life, then 25 years later when you think about it, the bitterness will still be there. It'll never leave you. The fire comes up. Someone mentions a topic, and there you go, right back into the person, right back into the subject. Every one of us, including your pastor, know what that's like. We have to fight that down because the fire could consume us, the fire could control us, and the fire will render us ineffective. If you doubt that, ask Leonardo da Vinci. He's been dead for a long time, but you could ask him anyway. <laughs> he was painting his masterpiece, The Last Supper, when he got in a fight with a fellow artist. And he was so angry, he said, I'm just going to take out my intensity on this painting. And I know which face I will paint first, the face of Judas. And then his friends looked at the painting. They said, ooh, we know that face. It's the guy you can't get along with. And he thought, I will pass down to posterity the man that I hate. The problem is he came to the face of Jesus, and da Vinci couldn't paint it. He tried for weeks. Nothing would happen. The Spirit of God said, Leonardo, this will not take place until you come to terms with the hatred you have in your heart. So he scratched out the face of Judas, went to the man, asked for forgiveness, and within a matter of hours, the face of Jesus and all the apostles came out, and he hands down a masterpiece to succeeding generations. As long as you hold hatred in your heart, 
The glory of God will never flow out of your life. You'll find yourself to be ineffective in more ways than one. In a paper entitled Granting Forgiveness or Harboring Grudges, researchers relate how they invited people to reflect on an individual who caused them harm. And as soon as the researchers got the people to reflect on that individual, they took a look at some physiological aspects, and here's what happened almost instantaneously. Sweaty palms, facial muscular tension, higher heart rate, increased blood pressure. Then the subjects were to imagine the possibility of completely forgiving the individual. And instantly, all the physiological abnormalities ceased. Health and happiness flow when you choose to forgive. If you don't, eventually, it will prematurely take your these men were basically on emotional death row because they were driven by their hatred to destroy Paul. It consumed them, verses 4 to 5. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea. He himself was about to leave shortly. Therefore, he said, let the influential men among you go there with me. And if there's anything wrong about this man, they could prosecute him. Paul's going to be watching as God steps in to ambush this particular ambush. Verses 6 to 7. After he had spent not more than 8 or 10 days among them, he went down to Caesarea. On the next day, he took a seat on the tribunal, ordering Paul to be brought. After Paul arrived, the Jews had come down from Jerusalem, stood against him, bringing, watch this, many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. I look at that phrase, many serious charges against them, which they could not prove, and I hook in to my own experience. The year was 1969. I was a senior at Saddleback High School. I was surfing. I was pole vaulting, and I was also working at a place called Alpha Beta. Some of you remember that place. Those of you a little bit younger don't. It was a very famous grocery store in those days. I was a checker, which was not a good job for Pastor Rick. Because unlike Debbie, I'm horrible with math. Now, these checkers today have it so easy. The computer does everything for them. Not in those days, baby. You had to figure out the math in your head. And I can't tell you how many mistakes I made. On one occasion, on a Friday night, after tallying everything out, I came up $200 short. Now, two weeks before... I'd come up short on the count out, and they discovered I made a mathematical error. But this time, because it was a higher amount, they assumed I sold the money. So the boss called me on my day off, and when he locked the door to his office, there was the Orange County Sheriff and a couple of policemen. Hey, Rick, do you own a Volkswagen van? I do. Did the engine recently blow up? I said, yes, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> they said, but you got it taken care of with the money you stole from the, the store, didn't you? I said, no, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. I, I've never stolen anything from anyone. Come on, Rick, if you confess right now, the charges will not be so intense. And for an hour, they badgered me. Now, eventually, I was released because they had no evidence. But for the next two weeks, they stationed a man at my checkout stand to watch every step I made. So I got a new job. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I got out of that mess. Problem is, Paul can't get out of this mess quite that easy. He's constantly pressured by, in this case, toothless wolves just like those people were toothless because they had no accusations that will stick. These charges are unsubstantiated. 
and they couldn't convince the governor. But there's a little phrase that I want you to see in the last verse that I read in verse 7. I want you to underline in your Bible. It's called the Jews. Say that with me. The Jews. That little phrase pops up 67 times in the book of Acts. And you know what I've discovered? 61 of the 67 times, it's in reference to Paul. And guess what else? It's never singular. These guys were wimp puppies. They were babies. They were wearing pampers. They had their thumbs in their mouths. We can't go against Paul unless we have 50 other guys to help us. It's never mano un mano. It's never one-on-one. -on -one. They always came in groups and packs. The man from Minnesota was asked by a visitor, are the bugs bad in your state? <laughs> he said, oh, no. We don't have a single mosquito if that's what you're worried about. The man asked, really? The Minnesota said, no, not a single mosquito. They're all married and have large families. <laughs> and that's exactly the way it was with these Jews. They just came in packs. And so the priests pursue their charges. And now secondly, as we saw last week, Paul pleads this case. Verse 8. Well, Paul said in his own defense, I have committed no offense against the law, against the Jews, against the temple, against Caesar. Luke makes it clear in his historical account, Christians are innocent. He tells us that over and over again from the first chapter to the last chapter of this 28 chapter book. Christians are law abiding citizens. Christians don't as a group do wrong against the government. This was cleared in chapter 1937 by the town clerk at Ephesus. He made that statement. It was stated again in Acts 18.21 by Gallio, pro-council of Achaia. And the frequent accusations that Christians are political revolutionaries was constantly brought up by these Jewish people. Christians are good people. People that were not so good looted and destroyed large cities in America for a six-month period. But that's okay. But then when we have a church service, then a pastor or a congregation is fined. There are godly pastors who are good, godly men who have the audacity to believe that the First Amendment actually was written to us. That we have the freedom and nobody and no government could take that away from us. Even if we didn't have that freedom as a nation, God gives it to us. But we have double protection. And some of these ministers have been fined over $100,000 because they have the audacity to worship God. Because they are seen as lawbreakers but they're not breaking any laws of God. That's exactly how Christians were treated. That's precisely how Paul was treated everywhere this man went. You know what's kind of fascinating? That these same religious leaders who spent 25 years attacking Paul as a political revolutionary, you know what they did in the, ninth, in the, the 60s, about 61 to about 70? They began their own little political revolt against Rome. They were the revolutionaries. And they were squelched and killed by Titus in the spring of 70 AD. Paul would have never done that. Verse 9. But Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor, isn't that an interesting statement, answered Paul and said, hey, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? You know why he asks that? Because like his predecessor, he's caught between a rock and a hard place. And Paul is innocent. If he was released, the Jews would overreact and result in a riot. And so what's Festus thinking? Man, I got to keep the peace. Peace out, bro. That's my basic thing. We got a bad situation going here, but I'm going to keep it peaceful, even though it's not peaceful. Visitors at a zoo were amazed to see a cage 
entitled Peaceful Coexistence. Inside the cage was a fox and four chickens. <laughs> the zookeeper said it's very easy to maintain the peaceful arrangement. All we have to do is occasionally toss in a few more chickens. <laughs> and that's what they're doing. They're going to toss Paul to the foxes. And then we'll keep the peace. Paul said, I'm not going there. Verses 10 and 11. I'm standing before Caesar tribunal. That's where I ought to be tried. I've done no wrong to the Jews. You know this very well. If then I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. See, Paul's not afraid to die. But if none of these things is true of me, which is men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Now today, if you're convicted of a crime and you're uh, displeased with the judge's decision, what could you do? You appeal to a higher court and a higher court and a higher court. Eventually, you can get to the Supreme Court, and that's exactly where Paul wants to go. The Supreme Court was Caesar. Paul's in a, a situation similar to our Savior, Jesus. When Jesus was on trial, the Jews had no power to kill him. So they had to go to a higher court, had appeal to Pilate, have him drive the nails that they wanted to drive into the Savior's hands. Paul's a Roman citizen. Paul has an option that was never offered or open to Jesus. He could appeal to Caesar. Question, if Jesus had that option open to him, would he have appealed to Caesar? No. no. Because he came to die. Paul's not planning on dying for anyone's sins. <laughs> he didn't say, take me to the cross. He said, take me to, to Caesar. I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to live as long as I can. He's no dummy. Verse 12. Then when Festus had conferred with his counsel, he answered, well, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. Paul has delivered his Caesarian appello. His Caesarian appello. The appeal to Caesar, and he's en route to accomplish the goal that God promised he'd accomplish in Acts 23, 11. You will get to Rome. But, like all of us, he has to wait for a while. It's not going to happen. He has some high hurdles he has to clear before he eventually reaches the capital. And one high hurdle is our next point, and that is the potentate is presented with the Christian. The potentate, a king, arrives on the scene. Verse 13, now, when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. Now, this is Herod Agrippa II, the last in the line of Herod. Because we're right now at about 60, 61 AD. When this guy dies, there are no more Herods ever to occur in the history of humanity. Because all the Jews will be destroyed, close to one million, at the destruction of Jerusalem. The rest of the living will be taken by the Romans, sent to labor camps throughout all of Europe. God in his matchless grace brings them back to Jerusalem. In 1948, absolute miracle. At this point, Herods are going down. And yet the Herods had a very interesting and entangling relationship with Christ. His father, this guy's father was Herod Agrippa I. Remember him? Chapter 12, he's the guy that sliced off uh, James's head. Planned on killing Peter the next day. And then Peter escapes by an angel. And then he's eaten by maggots and dies. And then there was another Herod. It was his great uncle, Herod Antipas. He pops up in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3. He's the ruler who in Mark chapter 6 cuts off the head of John the Baptist. He sought the life of Jesus in John 13 and then tries Jesus in Luke 23. And then his great granddaddy was Herod the Great. You remember him. He was a nice man. When Jesus was born and he started asking who's king of the Jews, where he's at, and then the Spirit of God, through an angel, led him out of Jerusalem into Egypt. And then Herod went 
crazy and began killing every single baby boy under the age of two in a bloody effort to stamp out any new king. That's the history of the Herods. They're a wonderful man. And now one of them shows up when Paul's here. He brings Bernice. Sounds like the kids are being tortured back there. I guess. <laughs> uh, or they're torturing the teacher, one of the two. <laughs> Bernice is his sister. You say, he's a grown man. What's he doing hunting his sister? Because this brother and sister team operated under the principle, incest is best. Yeah, he's sleeping with the sister. He said, that's sick. You're right, Rome agreed. And their incestuous affair was often the subject of gossip around the capital of Rome. And Bernice, oh, what a winner she was. She would leave Herod, and then she would bed down with Emperor Vespasian. And then after having sex with him, she'd slip into the room of his son, Titus, and then sex him up too. She was loose. She was licentious. She was a hussy. She was Herod's little harlot. But she always came back to baby brother, and they bedded down again and again and again. When the Jews began looking at a revolt against Rome, Herod became a traitor to his people and sided with Rome. Verses 14 to 18. They were spending many days there. Festus had Paul's case brought before king, saying, there's a man here who is left as a prisoner by Felix. When I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. And so I answered them that this is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. That sounds logical. So after they had assembled them, I did not delay. On the next day, I took my seat at the tribunal, ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against Paul, not of such crimes as I was expecting. Now, it was kind of caught me off guard. I wasn't expecting that. It wasn't what I was looking for. One man writes, one night our local newspaper was uh, re uh, giving us an article about an allegation that two Sesame Street characters, Bert and Ernie, were gay. The show's producer refuted this, pointing out that they were only puppets, not humans. They argue a lot, made up to show kids how to resolve conflict and remain friends. But while watching the report on TV, my wife Donna noticed that our young daughter was also listening. So Donna is struggling to come up with an explanation for the word gay. Our, desk, our crestfallen little girl is not even concerned about that. All she's concerned about is this. You mean they're puppets? <laughs> she's concerned about a completely different issue. Festus said, I want to find if they have any issues if Paul has broken the laws of Rome. All they're bringing up is silly religious issues. I don't care about that at all. Verse 19. But they simply add some points of disagreement about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted is alive. Now, there's the crux of the conflict. You could talk about Jesus and not get any problem from those who are anti-Christian today. Just talk about his love and mercy. Just talk about his tenderness. Just quote him in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. But you bring up the crucifixion for sin. And you talk about the resurrection for redemption. And you will get people angry. Because the world doesn't want to hear they're on a fast track to hell. But that's God's message. And your only hope of ever reaching heaven is the Holy Son of God and his resurrection. Paul preached the gospel everywhere he went. And it caused trouble. 
People didn't want to hear that. But we know as Christians, that little snippet called the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is what transforms our belief and makes it radically different than every other religion in the world. That's why every other religion can't get to heaven, because no other teaching or ism begins to suggest a crucified and resurrected Savior for your sins. Our cross is empty. His tomb is vacant. He's alive. Say that with me. He's alive. That's Christianity. That's what ignited this man. That's what allowed him to preach everywhere, town after town, persecution after persecution, because he met the resurrected Christ and he knows that he's alive. But this transforming truth had a whole hum effect on these leaders, these kings and governors. Verses 20 to 22. Being at a loss, I had to investigate these matters. I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and, and stand before trial on these issues. And Paul appealed, and Paul appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision. I ordered him to be kept in custody until I sent him to Caesar. Agrippa said to Festus, well, I'd like to hear him myself. And tomorrow, he said, you're going to hear him. But why should Agrippa hear him? I mean, why deal with this peanut when you're planning on going to Caesar? Let's go all the way to the top. This is a waste of time. This trial won't help Paul. Elgarda Ashley writes, at 82 years of age, my husband applied for his very first passport. He was told he needed a birth certificate, but his birth had never been officially registered. Upon hearing this dilemma, the passport agent said, well, in lieu of a birth certificate, you could bring a notarized affidavit from the doctor who delivered you. <laughs> now, there's a smart cookie. You want her working for you. You see that doctor be 118 at this point, you dodo bird. That's not going to help this man. Agrippa's not going to help Paul. And so Paul's going to want to go to Rome. And, and he will meet with Agrippa next week, and it'll be the last trial, thank God, that we're going to deal with in this book. It's trial after trial. And then it gets pretty exciting for Paul as he boards a ghost ship. He steps aboard the Titanic, and everything begins to change. A great adventure at sea. And then he survives a sea wreck. And then he's shipwrecked on Gilligan's Island. And then he's bitten by a snake. And then it's one thing after another for Paul. And then he finally gets to Rome. And guess what? The book of Acts ends with him still waiting trial in Rome. That's your life. That's my life. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting for God to step in. How much longer before the limbo ends, waiting for an operation, waiting for the day you'll finally feel healthy again, waiting for a spouse to make a decision for the Savior, waiting for a son or daughter to finally get right with God, waiting for a Redeemer to rescue you like he rescued Debbie from a confusing, conflicting crisis. Blossie Anderson knows what it means to wait. Blossie's an 85-year-old great-grandmother, spunky lady, who decided to go fishing alone on the Saluda River near Greenville, South Carolina. That's where her 62-year-old son, Lewis, said, I don't want you going. You know what Blossie said? Lewis, I had you. You didn't have me. I love that. So she picked up her pole and she took off. She trudged into the snake-infested swamp, and then she fell. Struggled to get back to her feet and became disoriented and began waiting in the wrong direction. She sat down exhausted, hoping someone would find her. Here's what Blossie said. I was never afraid. I knew the Lord was with me. I knew he'd bring me help. So I just waited. 
And Blasio waited all day and into the night. And then Blasio waited for the next day and into the next night. And rescuers monitored an extensive search. The problem is they were looking on the wrong side of the river. And the older woman said, I just waited and reminded myself, God will always be with me. Rescue workers dragged the river for her body and kept on searching day after day. Four days later, a rescuer is thrashing around the area. He hears the voice of an older woman. Granny, is that you? Lord have mercy, she said. I've been here for four days without a bite to eat. And they took her to Greenville General Hospital. She was treated for exhaustion and dehydration and released in the same day. And here's what the fearless 85-year-old said. I slept at night, rested during the day, and I wasn't cold. And I wasn't afraid of those snakes. God was with me, keeping me warm, keeping the snakes' jaws shut. He will shut the jaws on every fear you entertain today if you'll let him. If you'll let him. And when hope dims, we have this eternal truth from him. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You can take that to the bank. Let's bow together. It's what we need to hear during these difficult days, Lord. That's what people who have entertained fear, who are Christians, need to examine, need to embrace the faith of Blasi Anderson, the faith of the Apostle Paul, the faith of every believer going back from Enoch in Genesis 5 all the way to John in the book of Revelation. Every one of these people lived by faith. Everyone overcame fear. Everyone realized God is near. And everyone is a hero that we honor today. It's time for us in 2021 to become heroes. Sadly, too many have become zeros. Sitting around petrified. Paralyzed. Wondering when I'm going to die of this disease. What a stupid way to live. You're already dead if you're thinking that. You're in a rut, and a rut is a grave with both ends kicked out. So just have a funeral service for yourself and be done with it. That's not the faith walk. The faith walk is a trusting walk. The faith walk is a radical walk. The faith walk is a risky walk. And the faith walk is a waiting walk. And we trust you and wait for you to change things. Much of life involves waiting. But you know, there's one thing you never have to wait for. Forgiveness for your sins. God can grant you that in a second. But he needs your permission. Well, that hits me, Lord. I guess the reason people go to hell is because they don't give God permission to allow them to go to heaven. See, all he needs is for you to admit that you're a sinner. That's all. It's not a big deal. It just involves a little honest humiliation and the recognition that you can't get there on your own. If you will accept that fact, the road to glory is paved in beauty for you. God wants you to embrace that today. Maybe you've never done it. You've never given your life to Christ, but it's your desire and design to accept him today. You're saying, Pastor, I want to confess my sin. I want to accept Christ as my Savior. I want him to change my life.
if that hooks into your heart today and you want to become a Christian this morning, then I'll pray with you right now. Just lift up your right hand, good and high, and then I will know of your decision to accept Christ. Thank you, Father, for a brother who reaffirms his love for you and the fact that you've forgiven him from his sins. Give us the grace to go out into a world that is frightened. They're terrified. And help us to give them the hope and the happiness and the joy of knowing that if they would just give their life to Christ, all that fear could dissipate in a short period of time. Let us not live as frightened people. Let us not live with those darting, terrified eyes above the masks that we see. Let there be joy. Let there be radiance. Let there be happiness emanating for us in 2021 as we live for you. We ask this in Christ's name. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand together with our worship team this morning.